Helen worked as a cleaner for a construction company in the city. She was short, full-figured, and always dressed in a pair of knock-off rags. Sometimes she showed up for work smelling of alcohol, and on such days she was unable to work properly. Her older daughter, Rosie, a thin and pale schoolgirl, worked alongside her. Rosie was the first, but not the last, child in this family. Helen gave birth to many children, but she couldn't name the fathers of her children. Helen spent all her spare time with local vagrants and drunks, who often visited her home, regardless of the time of day. They spent hours clanging bottles in the living room and talking loudly. The children were already used to the fact that at such moments they needed to quickly grab something in the kitchen, at least bread, so as not to die of hunger, and sit quietly in their room while the company was having fun. Helen's children grew up like weeds in a field, almost from birth, used to taking care of each other. Rosie, the eldest daughter, had just turned 18. While still in school, she worked part-time several times a week in a clothing store, sorting and hanging up clothes. The second child was Paul, who turned 12. He spent most of his time outside, but never refused to help his older sister at home, knowing that she, in turn, would always give him something from her meagre salary. The youngest, Judy, would turn seven in a few months. She was a quiet and sickly child who could not communicate with her peers. Going out to the playground, she, like a frightened little animal, was always away from the noisy courtyard children. Judy envied the neighbouring girls who built sandcastles or pushed beautiful dolls in bright toy strollers around the yard, but such toys were never in the girls' family. All she could play with was an old battered teddy bear with one eye missing and a small plastic bucket with an equally small shovel. Throughout Rose's years in school, teachers always praised the diligent student and always used her as an example for her classmates. Rosie easily understood any subject. It was enough for her to read the material once and she was ready to answer at the board immediately. All the teachers knew the family the girl was growing up in and felt sorry for her. She's so smart, almost an excellent student. It's a shame the girl doesn't have a better future with such a mother. The teachers whispered among themselves. If it weren't for taking care of her younger siblings, she could have easily gone to college. Although being a cleaner doesn't require that, the vice principal added. She's going to substitute for her mother now, otherwise she'll be fired because she's pregnant again. Even though Helen tried to hide her six-month pregnancy, it was already noticeable. Everyone knew that there would soon be another addition to this family, but they didn't even suspect what it would be. At the age of 45, Helen already had three children. It was unclear from which father's Helen was expecting twins. Probably there wasn't a single person who didn't condemn this negligent mother of many children. Everyone who knew this mother thought that she only needed children for the social benefits. It was difficult to support three children on a cleaning lady's salary, but she still managed to have wild drinking parties with her friends. It was fortunate that sympathetic neighbours used to bring bags of clothes to her door, which the entire family wore. Children in the neighbourhood shouted after Helen, Hey, ragwoman, bring my socks. Maybe you're bringing my underwear. Rosie and Judy tried to walk away quickly, but Helen hadn't paid attention to this sort of treatment for a long time. In the last months of her pregnancy, Helen found it increasingly difficult to work, and Rosie replaced her every time she felt unwell. Her boss waved his hand at this good-for-nothing cleaner, as he called her. He didn't care who cleaned the floors as long as everything was clean. Moreover, 
her daughter did the job much better than her mother. Rosie, feeling sorry for her mother and afraid she might get fired, ran to the office to clean right after school and then studied until midnight. But that was heartbreaking for Rosie because it was not the future she had dreamed of. All she thought about was seeing herself in a beautiful form with a neat hairstyle. When she was ten years old, she found a magazine with such beauties standing by the gangway of a huge liner. Since then, this picture hung over her bed and was an unattainable goal. Teachers at school knew about her dream and tried to support her, urging her not to give up and to pursue her dream. Rosie was very attractive, quite unlike her mother, and had delicate facial features. If Helen were not pregnant again, Rosie might have tried to enroll in stewardess school. However, she understood that as soon as her mother gave birth, she would have to become a breadwinner in the family, leaving no time for further education. Nevertheless, the hope for the realization of her dream still burned in her soul, and she even started setting aside a penny for future education. She was happy that she could safely leave the younger siblings at home. Paul and Judy felt sorry for their older sister and tried to help her with everything around the house while she was at work. The local hooligans who knew Paul would never have believed that he could cook something, feed his younger sister, read to her, and put her to bed at night when the older one was at work. Only his sisters knew that Paul was a kind, intelligent, responsible boy, but life had made him embittered at people because his classmates laughed and mocked calling him a beggar. Teenagers, spoiled by parental love and care, often followed by shouting, Mom is going to throw out my old stuff today. Maybe I should carry it for you. And those standing nearby supported the joker, and everyone laughed together. In those moments, Paul, without thinking twice, rushed at the bullies with his fists, and then inevitably stood in the principal's office, listening to the next lecture. Helen almost never went to school, even if they called her. Instead, everything was up to Rosie. The principal could lecture for hours. Well, Rosie, influence your brother. Look at you. What a smart girl you are. But your brother is just a little bandit with such behaviour. He can end up in the jail. Every time Rosie promised to talk to her brother, and returning home with him from school, tearfully begged, Paul, I'm begging you not to get into fights any more. They won't even let you into school later. Meanwhile, the time before the birth was getting shorter, and Rosie was becoming increasingly worried about it. Her mother had not walked so hard during the previous pregnancies as she did with the twins this time. Apparently, the years were taking their toll. One day, Rosie rushed to the office where her mother Helen worked. Upon opening the door, she saw her mother writhing in pain on a visitor chair in the reception hall, and the director, as white as chalk, scarily muttering, Where are the doctors? Helen, hold on, I beg you. Seeing Rosie, the man was happy. Rosie, sit with your mother. Now the ambulance is coming. I have called them. The paramedics arrived a few minutes later and took Helen to the hospital. When Rosie rushed to the maternity hospital the next morning, she was informed that her mother had died from a heart attack. However, thanks to a caesarean section, two beautiful boys were born and were saved. This news was like a sharp knife to the girl's heart. She didn't faint only because the doctor managed to quickly catch her by the arm and sit her down on the couch next to him. He was still talking about the baby's weight, height, and when she could pick them up and bury Helen. But Rosie heard it all as if from a distance. She silently stood up and left. Rosie sat down on a bench in the park in front of the maternity hospital 
covering her face with her hands and crying bitterly. She didn't know how to go on living, how to cope with all this grief. Rosie didn't know how long she had been sitting like this. She didn't remember all the following days, clearly. Taking care of her brother and sister, organizing the funeral, all of this was happening as if in a terrible dream. The neighbors helped a lot, feeling sorry for the poor girl, and the mother's boss brought her money. There were only ten people at the funeral, three of whom were Rosie, Paul and Judy, who didn't stop crying. When it was all over, Rosie begged the director to take her instead of her mother, since she was now the only breadwinner in the family. The girl worked around the clock, waving a mop at her job for twelve hours and then washing and cooking for the younger ones until midnight. Luckily, by that time, school was already behind her. One evening, coming home, she found the apartment empty. None of the children were at home. Rosie's heart beat wildly in a terrible premonition. She rushed out onto the street, hoping that they were somewhere nearby, although she knew perfectly well that they would never leave the house at this time without her permission. Exhausted, Rosie found a bench by the entrance and tears streamed down her cheeks. She was about to go to the police when her neighbour from across the hall sat down next to her. Mrs. Herriman was Rosie's first teacher and always greeted her and treated the kids to pastries when they were home alone. Rosie, the children were taken away by the child welfare authorities. The neighbours complained that the mother died and you're not home all the day. The representative said that the children were left to themselves. You're already an adult, and they'll be all sent to an orphanage. Let's go to my place. I'll give you a calming mixture and some tea. Rosie spent several hours at her neighbor's place, crying and calming down. I'll still take them all back, the girl sobbed. Her neighbour calmed her down and advised her, My girl, it's better for you to go to study now, because they won't give them back to you now. But if you study hard, get a good job, then you can take them back. When Rosie returned home, she didn't sleep all night, thinking about Mrs. Merriman's words. By morning, she had made up her mind to pursue her dream and become a stewardess. She packed her modest belongings and went to say goodbye to her kind neighbour. Thank you, Mrs. Herriman, for supporting me and advising me on what to do, Rosie said, hugging her. I decided to fulfil my dream and become a stewardess because then I can definitely take my kids back. The pensioner asked her to wait and went to the kitchen. When she returned a few minutes later, she handed her a package and a note. Here, I baked some pies. They'll be helpful for you on the road, she said, smiling. And there's also a phone number and address of my good old classmate. She lives in the city where you'll be studying. For the first few days, you can stay with her. I'll call her today and warn her. She lives alone in a spacious apartment. Her husband died many years ago. I think she'll be happy to take in such a smart girl. They hugged each other goodbye, and Rosie set out to start her new, independent life. Of course it was scary for her to be alone in a big, unfamiliar city, but the dream of becoming a stewardess gave her strength. She went to the address given by Mrs. Herriman and was greeted by a small, thin old lady at the door. Good afternoon, Rosie began timidly. Mrs. Herriman gave me your address. The hostess smiled kindly, opening the door wider and inviting her in. Yes, my old friend called me yesterday and sent me a modest and beautiful girl, and I see she didn't disappoint. Come in, don't be shy, otherwise I'll go crazy here alone. Let me show you your room right away. 
The girl, upon entering the apartment, tried to explain, I am only here for a day, then I'll go to the dormitory or rent an apartment. The woman looked at her, surprised, and asked, Are you crazy? A hostel? A rented apartment? If Mrs. Herriman asked me for someone, it means that person is worth it. I live alone. My only son lives very far away. So I'm pleased that Mrs. Herriman sent me such a good neighbour. Rosie reached into her small, worn-out vintage shoulder bag and pulled out neatly folded bills from its depths. She handed them to the elderly woman, saying timidly, Here, this is all I have. Let me just rent a room at your place, then. It's not much, but I'll compensate once I start earning. Despite being a tiny elderly woman in her seventies, Mrs. Gibson was a mischievous girl at her heart. She took the bills and squinted as if examining the denominations, then returned them to Rosie's bag, placing it back on her shoulder. She looked at the bewildered Rosie and said playfully, This fortune will come in handy for you for a couple of days in the city. Let's make a deal. You won't pay me anything for the first three or four months, and once you start working somewhere, you can pay me then. Mrs. Gibson showed Rosie to a small but cosy room that was clearly her son's room. It was adorned with sports medals, certificates and trophies. Seeing Rosie's confusion, Mrs. Gibson said with a hint of sadness, My son rarely visits me, but I want his room to feel lived in. I've made the bed and there's plenty of space in the closet. You can live here as long as you need to. And if his awards are in the way, I can take them to my room. He was into swimming and always came back with awards. That evening they sat in the kitchen for over two hours. You're smart. You'll learn everything and then get your brothers and sister back. But for now, focus on your studies, Mrs. Gibson said. The next day, Rosie went straight to the airport because she didn't know where to study to become a flight attendant. To her surprise, there was an announcement for flight attendant recruitment at the entrance. After carefully studying all the requirements listed in the announcement, she was almost certain that she would make it. And she did. Without much difficulty, Rosie passed all the necessary tests, checks and medical examinations. She literally flew back to Mrs. Gibson on wings, learning that she had been selected. I've enrolled! I'm going to be a flight attendant! Rosie shouted, kicking off her shoes and walking with a graceful stride, leaning over imaginary passengers and speaking to them with a captivating smile. Mrs. Gibson, who had come out of the kitchen at Rosie's call, put her hands on her chest and laughed happily, watching this improvised scene. When Rosie reached the end of the hallway, she happily plopped onto a chair. Mrs. Gibson said, Good for you. I never doubted it. You're a natural-born flight attendant. Everything will be wonderful for you, I'm sure of it. I knew you'd come with good news, so... I baked your favourite cheesecake. I can't forget the story about the piece of cake that Mrs. Herriman brought to you and you only managed to have a teaspoon. Now, you have every right to eat it all yourself. Rosie indeed tasted that seemingly airy and incredibly delicious dessert only once. Mrs. Herriman, her neighbour, had treated her with a piece of delicious cheesecake for her birthday, but at home she saw how much her younger brother and sister enjoyed the treat. Rosie allowed herself only a couple of small bites, no bigger than a walnut. Several years had passed, but the taste remained unforgettable for her. Now she could eat an entire cake standing on the table, but instead of joy, tears filled her eyes. 
Mrs. Gibson immediately understood what Rosie was thinking. She shook her hand and said softly, Don't worry, dear. You will definitely get your siblings back once you stand on your own two feet. And I'll bake a big cheesecake for each of you. For now, you're with me, and you're an incredibly intelligent person who has achieved her goal. You can indulge in the treat. That evening, they once again stayed up late in the kitchen. Rosie excitedly recounted how her testing had gone and how everything had been explained to her about her future long-awaited profession. At that moment, she was the happiest person on earth. For the first time in years, she had beautiful, vivid dreams at night. In them, she was on board a huge liner, looking out the windows at the lights of a big city. She wore the same outfit as the girls in the picture. Every morning for several months, Rosie woke up a couple of hours earlier than usual and quickly got ready to walk to school for her lessons. She loved these morning walks, which gave her a great mood and a boost of energy for the whole day. But to be honest, Rosie tried to save her already meagre savings and did not use public transport. Studying at the courses was enjoyable for her. The group consisted of only 15 people, but all the teachers immediately noticed the smart, open and charming girl. They were amazed at how easily a single poorly dressed student from the countryside could grasp everything on the fly. After completing the courses, Rosie was immediately hired by the airline as the best graduate, and soon her heart was pounding as she climbed up the steps of the plane, the first in her life. The flight was not very long, only an hour one way, but for someone who had dreamed of seeing clouds from the other side all her life, it passed like a moment. She didn't even realize how she was already back in her city. At home, Rosie enthusiastically told Mrs. Gibson about her impressions. You can't imagine how beautiful everything looks from up there. It's just a pity that I couldn't press my face against the window and enjoy it all. And the passengers are all so serious. The crew is just wonderful. They're all a bit older, but that's probably a good thing. They take care of me so much. As if waking up from her happiness, Rosie became sad and added, Now the main thing is to earn money faster to rent an apartment and take my brothers and sister with me. Mrs. Gibson sighed and replied, Everything will work out for you. See how it's already going well. For now, enough talking. You must be hungry. I boiled potatoes and fried cutlets. Go take off your uniform and let it wait for the next flight and let's have dinner. Rosie looked at her uniform as if she were a child who didn't want to part with her favourite toy. Mrs. Gibson laughed and jokingly scolded her. Are you going to sleep in this beautiful uniform? Go and take it off. No one will steal it. As much as Rosie wanted to stay beautiful for as long as possible, she had to put on her simple old dress again. She carefully hung her uniform in the closet with a wild desire to put it back on again soon. For the first few months, Rosie flew on not very long flights. But when the so-called internship was over, she began to be sent to distant cities. Once, while on one of her distant flights, a young handsome man called out to her. She had seen him before. He often flew on this flight. The passenger was probably some kind of businessman. He looked about 35 years old, and he was always in a suit, clean-shaven, with a light very becoming tan. Rosie did not understand brand name things, but the watch and the briefcase that the stranger travelled with were very similar to those she had seen in expensive magazines left by passengers on the plane. Rosie remembered the man because he had flown with her for several flights in a row, and throughout the entire journey he tried to catch her eye. 
If it happened, he smiled so radiantly that Rosie felt embarrassed and immediately looked away. Her college, the cheerful and carefree Miranda, who witnessed one of these moments, whispered, Oh, he's flying again, and looking at you, as if he's going to take you straight from the plane to the wedding. I think he only flies this flight for you. I accidentally saw him staring at you at the airport. I wish my handsome man would look at me like that. Rosie approached the man who had called her over. Excuse me, for God's sake, he began quietly. Do you have any medication for heart pain? Rosie was momentarily thrown off. The man didn't look sick. On the contrary, his short-sleeved shirt revealed well-defined muscles and his face had a healthy colour. But the girl was scared. Anything could happen. Just a moment, please, she asked. I'll bring the first aid kit and let me help you recline a bit. She reached out for the backrest, but her wrist was easily grabbed by a strong male hand. I don't think you have the right medicine in your first aid kit, the stranger whispered. Is it possible to cure the heart of unrequited love? Rosie was taken aback, and her heart betrayed her by racing. The girl blushed, but didn't pull away. Sensing her agitation, the passenger continued, But there is one way to save me from imminent death. Agree to go out with me today. I promise to behave very humbly, like a man on his deathbed. Rosie looked at the man and realized she really wanted to go on this date. She found him attractive. Gathering her courage, she gently freed her wrist and smiling, quietly said, I'll think about it. To which the man, happy, said, My name is Damon, and I'll wait for you as long as it takes, starting right now. I'll wait after the flight, because if a woman says she'll think about it, it means she hasn't said no. The rest of the journey, the passenger never took his eyes off her, which made the girl very uncomfortable. Rosie wanted to go on this date, but at the same time she was afraid of it. She had no idea how to behave with a man alone. Everything she knew about relationships came from romantic books taken from the library and sentimental TV shows she occasionally watched. After the flight, Rosie and the crew went to the airport building to fill out all the necessary post-flight documents and go home. Miranda was the first to see Damon. She touched Rosie's elbow and nodded enthusiastically toward him, whispering, Look, Rosie, you seem to have won a millionaire. That must cost a fortune. In the centre of the hall, right in their path, stood Damon with a huge bouquet of beautiful velvet roses. It was difficult to count the number of flowers, but it could confidently be said there were no fewer than a hundred. The man approached Rosie and, as always, charmingly smiling, said, I am pleased to see you again. Of course, this bouquet can't compare to your beauty, but I promise to find and give you a diamond worthy of such beauty soon. Miranda stood, her mouth open, as if all this was meant for her. Rosie, on the other hand, taking the flowers, said barely audibly, Thank you very much. They are stunning. The crew commander, the oldest in the team, approached Miranda and taking her by the arm, asked, Are you heading to the exit? Go with us. We'll see you off. Rosie will figure it out on her own. The colleagues waved to Rosie and headed towards the exit. Damon saw that the girl was flustered and suggested, Let me drive you home first. You must be tired. But in the evening, you'll promise me a date. We'll go to a beautiful little restaurant. Damon had a car in the airport parking lot. Rosie didn't know much about car brands, but the car was clearly expensive. 
In the sunlight, the black beauty sparkled as if it had just come out of the showroom. On the way, Damon told her that he had been briefly married once, but the marriage fell apart, allegedly because of his wife's infidelity. In the city, he had his own office furniture manufacturing company, inherited from his parents and thriving for many years. It was the business trips that took him to other cities, concluding new contracts. Damon drove Rosie home. They agreed that he would wait for her at the entrance at six in the evening. The girl felt that she really liked the man, and she wanted the evening to come sooner, but it was only ten in the morning when Rosie opened the door to the apartment, and Mrs. Gibson was already waiting for her in the hallway. "'Welcome back, Rosie,' the old woman said kindly, smiling. "'And I see that my beauty was brought in by a gallant gentleman. "'He opened the door and handed you to get out. "'And what flowers! Did he rob a store?' "'Rosie struggled to bring the bouquet into the room "'and placing it on the table, thoughtfully replied, "'Oh, Mrs. Gibson, I've never had anything like this happen to me before.' This is a passenger who often flies with me. He's been looking at me for a long time, and then he spoke up. He's so handsome that it takes my breath away. The girl fell silent. Admiring the flowers, Mrs. Gibson said, Oh, my dear, you've fallen in love. Be careful, my dear. These handsome men promise a lot and then break your heart. Rosie immediately flared up and defended her cavalier. "'Why do you say that?' she said, almost in tears. "'You don't know him, and neither do I yet. But I feel that he's not like that.' "'Well, all right, all right. As they say, we'll see. You rest now. You're probably tired, and I'll go for a walk to my neighbour. With difficulty waiting for the evening, Rosie put on the only dress she bought with her first paycheck, which fit perfectly on her slender figure. She ran like a schoolgirl to her first date in her life and listened with a pounding heart to Damon, who joked and told funny stories all the way. It was incredibly pleasant for her to be with him, and she laughed heartily at every joke he made. Rosie felt as if she had known him for an eternity, and with each passing minute, he became closer and closer. Damon brought Rosie to a small but very cosy restaurant. At the entrance, they were greeted by Damon's friend, the owner of this place. Hello, dear guests, the man said first, and kissing the girl's hand, continued, Allow me to introduce myself. A devoted friend of this gentleman, Henry, he whispered in my ear about the goddess he had met flying at bird height. But I couldn't even imagine that you were so beautiful. I am happily married, so I can only admire your beauty from distance. Rosie blushed, feeling embarrassed, and timidly replied, No one has ever complimented me so much. Thank you very much. Henry led them into the restaurant, where a beautiful melody was playing in a separate small hall, and a table for two was set in the centre. Why only one table and no one else from the visitors? Rosie asked in surprise. This evening the music and this room are only for you, and my heart seems to belong to you forever, Damon replied. Rosie was very pleased. Everything that was happening seemed to her like a chapter from one of the novels that she had read. They spent a wonderful evening together, talking a lot, trying to get to know each other better, dancing, and Rose's head was spinning, not so much from champagne as from happiness. After the restaurant, Damon escorted Rosie home, and she was pleased that he did not rush things. The girl wanted this unforgettable evening to end just like that. The next morning, Rosie woke up and, remembering the past date, smiled. Mrs. Gibson knocked on the door and, smiling mysteriously, said, While you were sleeping, 
Someone remembered you and sent you something nice. Go to the kitchen and take a look. At this rate, we'll be able to open a flower shop soon. Rosie literally jumped out of her bed and ran to the kitchen in her nightgown. There, she grabbed an envelope attached to a huge basket of flowers and with squeals of delight, opened it. Quickly reading the contents, she held it close to her chest and hummed something cheerful, spinning around the kitchen with closed eyes and a happy smile. She was returned to reality by Mrs. Gibson's voice. Go change your clothes. What if the prince comes? Rosie went to her room, clutching a postcard to her chest. She was relieved because after their date, she had worried that Damon, despite his tender farewell, wouldn't want to see a simple girl from the province again, especially with such a family. At first, Rosie scolded herself for being so open with Damon, telling him about her not-so-good mother and her boyfriends, about her death during childbirth, and about the little ones left in the shelter. She feared that he, being so smart, handsome and successful, would easily be disappointed in her. But after reading the postcard he sent with a bouquet, where he again confessed his love and invited her on a date, she was over the moon. Now Rosie was sure that Damon was truly in love with her, and she realised that she was head over heels in love too. Damon wrote that he would wait for her at the entrance at noon, and Rosie couldn't sit still for the rest of the time. Mrs. Gibson, who had quietly peeked into the room a few times, only sighed and left. She already knew about Rosie's upcoming date, and understanding her excitement, tried not to disturb her. Five minutes before the appointed time, Rosie dashed out onto the street, where a familiar car was already waiting. Damon came out to meet her, and took Rosie's hand, saying, Let's go quickly. I have a surprise for you. I think you'll like it. In half an hour, they arrived at a sturdy wooden building in front of a fenced field. Well, here we are, Damon smiled. Let's go, I'll show you something. Taking each other's hands, they went to one of the buildings. Rosie exclaimed with delight. It's a stable! The dream of my life! How did you know? Damon looked at her mysteriously and simply replied, In my understanding, all princesses love to ride horses. I'm sure you'll love it too. Rosie quickly learned how to handle the perfectly white stallion assigned to her. In just under an hour, she was happily laughing, easily galloping around the circle, confidently holding on to the saddle. The walk came to an end, and Rosie thankfully kissed Damon on the cheek, blushing. Thank you so much. I've only seen horses on TV before. This is unforgettable. I'll remember this day for the rest of my life. Why remember it for the rest of your life? Damon whispered, gently pulling her towards him. We can come here every weekend if you like. At that moment, he kissed her, and Rosie felt like she was ready to faint from the overwhelming feelings. They spent the rest of the day and then the night together in a beautiful hotel on the shore of the lake. There was a romantic candlelit dinner in a beautiful gazebo set right above the water's surface and a bed strewn with rose petals, and a night filled with love confessions. From that day on, Rosie and Damon started dating. He almost always met her from her flights, if he wasn't flying it himself. He showered her with expensive things and invited her to the most fashionable restaurants in the city. Meanwhile, Rosie never wondered why, Despite having his huge apartment, he never invited her there. One day, Mrs. Gibson, who had never meddled in Rosie's personal life, suddenly asked, 
I don't understand if you have such love. Why hasn't your suitor proposed to you? He's not married, is he? The girl responded indignantly. What are you talking about? Hasn't he spent so much time with me, not to mention spending a lot of money? He just has a lot of work right now, and as soon as he deals with it a bit, he will definitely take me with him. So, I will be leaving you soon, and then, who knows, we might even get married. The elderly woman shook her head incredulously. Oh, he's just fooling you. When you love, then it's awful to be away from your loved one, even for a moment. At that moment, Rosie didn't want to argue. She was too happy. One day, she felt nauseous and started reacting strongly to certain smells, immediately remembering how her late mother had suffered from the same thing. She hurried to the doctor and found out she was pregnant. Rosie was ready to jump for joy, as giving birth to a child with her beloved was great happiness. The girl didn't even doubt that Damon would also be happy with this news, and they would get married right away. Literally on wings, she rushed to their meeting to tell him the good news as soon as possible. But his reaction was unexpected for Rosie. She had imagined that he would run to her, lift her up, and kiss her joyfully like in the movies. But instead, he said coldly, I hope you're not thinking of giving birth just to breed poverty, like your mother. I don't need this child at all. It's a good thing that Rosie was sitting on the hotel bed where they usually met. Otherwise, she would have definitely fainted. She couldn't believe that her beloved was saying all this. But in a voice that was foreign to her, he continued, Did you really believe that I could tie my life to a peasant like you? You're just my entertainment, a temporary flirtation, and I will marry someone worthy. My fiancé comes from a noble and well-known family in the city, with a good dowry in the form of two sewing factories, we have been dating for a year now, and in three weeks we will have a wedding. And what do you have besides a cute face? Your dowry consists of a bunch of brothers and sisters. I am sorry, but I don't need that kind of wealth. Damon pulled out his wallet. Not counting the bills, he pulled out a hefty stack and threw it on the magazine table, sharply saying, I think this is enough to get rid of the problem, and I ask you not to make a scene or bother me any more. From this day on, you are on your own, and I am on my own. As soon as the door of the room closed behind him, tears flowed from Rose's eyes like a fountain. She cried silently, making no sound, and at some point it seemed that even her heart stopped beating. The girl ran to the window, opened it abruptly, and began to inhale the air greedily, as if afraid of suffocating. Then, suddenly looking down from the sixth floor, she climbed onto the windowsill, but her foot slipped as if someone pushed her back, and she fell to the floor. God, thank you. You saved me from a terrible act. I have my own family and I was going to jump out the window, she thought at that moment. She considered everything that had happened, a sign from above, and decided to live no matter what. To her surprise and joy, Mrs. Gibson, upon learning of what had happened, did not lecture or moralise, but only patted her on the head and said, Life is testing you again, but don't worry, we'll get through it together. They agreed not to mention this scoundrel again, and he stopped appearing on Rose's flights. The morning sickness ended quickly, and the girl decided to fly as much as she could. No one from the crew even suspected her condition. She didn't know how she would live on, but decided to leave everything to fate. Rosie felt that in the sky it was much easier 
for her to endure everything, and diving headfirst into work, she had no time to think about the bad. In flight, she felt that the passengers needed her, and this gave her strength. Once during a flight, a cry for help came from the cabin. An elderly woman was holding the head of a seven-year-old boy who was suffocating. It turned out that he had asthma, and the grandmother had forgotten to bring a special inhaler with her. Help, please, Sam, my only grandson, Rosie asked Miranda to take care of the elderly woman while she quickly got to remember everything she knew about helping such passengers. She helped the boy to do the necessary exercises, calmed him down, sat him down so that more air could enter his lungs, gave him a few sips of a hot drink. After a while, the boy calmed down, and his breathing gradually returned to normal. The grandmother thanked Rosie with tears in her eyes, and said that she wouldn't have survived another stroke of fate. It turned out that the woman's son, Sam's father, had been paralysed for over a year. He and his wife were returning from work when a minibus collided with them at full speed. After landing, a grateful passenger approached Rosie and begged her to come to their home. Please don't refuse, she said. I already spoke with your colleague and learned that you're only flying back tomorrow. You don't have any relatives in this city, so stay with us. Unexpectedly, Rosie agreed. She felt sorry for the woman, named Mrs. Clark, and decided to visit her briefly. In the taxi, the boy sat next to Rosie and cheerfully told her about his family. It was impossible to imagine that just a few hours ago he had barely survived. Sam turned out to be a very intelligent child, and as if trying to impress his new acquaintance, he recited poems and talked about everything he knew. Unable to withstand Sam's behaviour, Mrs. Clark tried to pull him away. Sam, enough nonsense with our guest. You won't stop talking for a second. Please forgive him. He seldom behaves like this with strangers, but apparently he really likes you. Exiting the taxi, the boy immediately grabbed Rosie's hand and pulling her towards the nearest building, happily said, Let's go quickly. I'll introduce you to my dad. He's very nice, but he can't walk yet. However, my grandma and I often go to church and ask God to help him get up. They climbed to the third floor of a new high-rise building. The apartment was clearly not cheap. A concierge was sitting in the lobby. The elevators were beautiful with mirrors, one for passengers and the other for cargo. Paintings hung on all the stairwells and landings, and flowers were everywhere. Rosie had never seen such beauty before. Opening the door with her key, Mrs. Clark shouted into the apartment, Eric, we're home, and not alone. We have a wonderful guest. Come in, Rosie. Don't be shy. At that moment, a man in a wheelchair emerged from the room, smiling broadly. Well, finally, I've been waiting for you, he said, hugging his son who ran to him. So tell me, how was your flight? And introduce me to our guest. Judging by her beautiful uniform, you found her in the sky. When they all entered the enormous living room, Mrs. Clark quickly told the story of what happened in the sky. With gratitude in her eyes, she added, If it weren't for Rosie, I don't know how it would have ended. When everyone had calmed down a bit, Mrs. Clark headed to the kitchen, and Eric suggested a tour of the apartment. Let me show you everything. I was happy when I bought this place. Rosie agreed, and the apartment truly amazed her. The dimensions were impressive, a large hall instead of a corridor, a living room that was like an entire Mrs. Gibson's apartment, and a kitchen that was combined with a dining room. The bedrooms numbered four. One, judging by Sam's toys and wallpaper, belonged to a child. The second was very delicate, with a large bed, and was clearly a woman's room. Based on the suitcase from the plane, it belonged to Mrs. Clark. The third, according to Eric, was for guests, and there was minimal furniture and no belongings. 
Finally, the man opened the last door and said, This used to be my and my wife's bedroom, but now it's my den. In the room there was a large double bed, a dresser, and a built-in wardrobe with mirrored doors. Everything was in the same style and colour, and looked very beautiful. Next to the bed was a small table on wheels, filled with various medications. Then they went to Eric's office. This is where I work, and I work a lot, he said, somewhat embarrassed. What do you do, if it's not a secret, of course? Rosie asked, embarrassed. I'm really impressed by your courage, because many people in your situation give up. Eric turned to his guest and said, I didn't come to this immediately. There was feeling that life was over and there was a panic. It seemed that everything had collapsed. My wife died, I was crippled, and my business partner turned out to be a scoundrel who betrayed me at the most difficult moment. As soon as I ended up in the intensive care unit after that terrible accident, he transferred all the money from our joint business to other accounts. At first, when I got slightly better, I tried to find him. But unfortunately, it was all in vain. As Eric spoke, Rosie looked at a collage of photos on the wall. In many of the pictures, Eric was with an incredibly beautiful blonde, and both of their eyes, even in the photo, were shining with happiness. There were several photos with Eric, still very young, was standing in a soldier's uniform with his fellow soldiers. Since then, he hasn't changed much, except for the fact that he now uses a wheelchair. Suddenly, Rosie was drawn to a group photo where about ten people were standing. There were men and women, but she only knew one person well, and there was no doubt about that. In the photo, slightly younger than now, Damon was standing. Excuse me, Rosie said nervously. Who are you within this photo? The man moved closer and sadly replied, These are former employees of my former company. Are you asking about the darling of all the women in our office on the right of me? That's the scoundrel who, taking advantage of my position, deprived me of everything I had. It's a good thing that this apartment remained. Now I'm trying to create something new, but starting alone without money and in such a position, it's difficult. Turning to Eric, Rosie said with a hint of joy in her voice, I think I can help you. Unfortunately, I know very well the person who betrayed you. He betrayed me too, or rather my love, but that's not the point now. He hasn't disappeared anywhere. He usually flies on the same flight, only he has been trying to avoid me lately. He told me, by the way, that the business came from wealthy parents who died some time ago. Eric slapped his legs indignantly and almost shouted, Wealthy parents? His grandmother raised him all his life, went out of her way to get her grandson an education, and he, having studied, got a job with me and sent her to a nursing home. I found out about this completely accidentally, already after he betrayed me. Then he said that his poor grandmother had died of a heart attack. A little later I was very surprised when he offered me to become partners. He had money then and decided to invest them in business. It turned out that after his grandmother's death, he sold her apartment. That was his whole capital. How did you meet him? And where can he be found? Rosie apologised and said she didn't want to talk about her relationship with this person, but she would gladly help find him and expose him as a fraud. For some time, they developed a plan for further actions against the swindler, and then Mrs. Clark called them to dinner. During dinner, Rosie felt like they were all very close and dear to her, although she had only known them for a short time. Sam was constantly talking, addressing her specifically. Mrs. Clark took care of the guest, trying to treat her with the best piece of the dishes. With Eric, they periodically made eye contact, and Rosie felt especially warm every time. As they parted, they promised to meet again, Mrs. Clark noticing during lunch 
how her son and the stewardess were exchanging glances, was already praying for their new meeting, because she liked the girl from the first minute. Not for nothing did she persuade her to come and visit. And Sam, clinging to Rosie's hand, didn't let go until she promised to visit them on her next flight. Upon returning to her city, Rosie easily tracked down her ex-lover, who continued to fly in the same direction, but deliberately bought a ticket for a flight with a different crew. With his money, nothing was impossible, but only he thought so. Upon returning to her city, Rosie easily tracked down her ex-lover, who continued to fly in the same direction. Sometimes good things happen even without financial means. Rosie, having tracked down Damon on landing, called Eric, and upon arrival at Damon's destination, the police arrested him. It turns out that acquiring large amounts of money does not mean acquiring wisdom. During this time, the swindler changed his passport, replacing all of his information, bought a small furniture factory, and planned to marry a rich bride, probably hoping to swindle his future father-in-law. With the remaining money stolen from Eric, he even booked a honeymoon trip that he never took. He didn't need any vacation packages anymore. During the trial, the investigator found out that besides blatantly stealing his companion's money, the villain was also responsible for the terrible accident that killed Eric's wife. Upon learning this, Eric, confined to a wheelchair, was ready to crawl up and strangle the scoundrel right in the courtroom. Only Rosie, who sat next to him, was able to calm him down by taking his hand. Damon was given a considerable sentence. Eric got back a decent amount of money, which was used for a spinal cord operation. A year had passed. Darling, don't... Darling, don't worry, Eric said lovingly. Rosie standing at the altar at her wedding, felt an insane sense of trust, love and respect for the person standing next to her for the first time in her life. Only now did she realise that he was the one sent to her by fate. It is Eric who will stand behind like a stone wall. Not only she, but those who were present at the wedding in the church and watched them. Rosie turned around and barely held back her tears. Mrs. Clark and Mrs. Gibson, holding the hands of Rosie's twin brothers, stood behind her, simply glowing with happiness. Sam proudly rocked the stroller with the little baby girl. The noticeably grown-up Paul ran back and forth between his brothers and newborn niece, trying to fix something for them each time. And Judy stood aside, as always ready to help at any moment, but not participating in anything. When the priest proclaimed the young couple husband and wife, everyone clapped and rushed to hug the newlyweds. Mrs. Clark cried and said to the bride, Fate sent you to us for a reason. You are our saviour. Eric, still limping a little, approached and hugged his wife. Well, my dear, he said so lovingly that Rosie was ready to burst into tears. Now, we will go all to our big house, where everyone will have a place. Initially, Rosie didn't pay much attention to Eric's words. However, when they arrived at a beautiful three-story house, she looked at her husband questioningly. I just thought, Eric began mysteriously, that even in our huge apartment such a family would feel cramped. So I made this substitution. Now we will all live together here in the fresh air. Mrs. Gibson, there will be a big room for you too. Additionally, your son and grandchildren can come visit you here, and my mum will have more fun with you. Initially, the residents of the cottage settled were sceptical of the noisy families. However, over time, the close-knit, large family won the love and trust of everyone, from young to old. They became the biggest, 
but also the most loving and friendly family in the district. <laughs>